Okay, well, welcome to Roots of Reality Experiences. Today I'm joined by Peter Vermees, who is the head coach of the professional soccer team Sporting Kansas City and is the longest tenured head coach with the team in MLS history. As a coach, he has led Sporting Kansas City to three U.S. Open championships and one MLS Cup championship. Additionally, in the past as a player, Coach Vermees has also won the MLS Cup with Kansas City. Thus, he is the only person to ever win the MLS Cup with the same team as a player and coach. Lastly, Coach Ramiz is also a former MLS Defender of the Year, an MLS All-Star, an MLS Best 11 Selectee, and a former player for the U.S. Olympic and World Cup team, as well as a member of the U.S. Soccer Hall of Fame. So, Coach Ramiz, thanks for coming on today. My pleasure, Ben. So, when did you first develop a passion for soccer? It's probably in my DNA. My father was a uh, both my parents immigrated from Hungary in 1956. My father was a professional soccer player. Um, I had two older brothers that played as well. So probably, you know, the first things I saw in and around my house or wherever was people kicking a ball around. So it, it's always been something that I know for myself. It, I can, you know, whenever you can recollect, you know, as early as you can as yeah. a youngster. Um, it's all I remember doing is kicking a ball around. Sure. So at what age was it then that you wanted to become a professional soccer player? That's a really good question. So um, I was born in, uh, in 66. And so uh, it would have been 76, um, 10 years old. I was watching the Olympics. And... I asked my father, I said, why is there no soccer on TV? I thought soccer was in the Olympics. He goes, well, soccer is in the Olympics. It's probably the most uh, participated from a fan's perspective at the Olympics. They have the largest crowds. But at that time, soccer wasn't big in the United States. So we right. didn't show any games. And obviously, times have changed with, you know, apps and everything else to be able to watch anything you want to. But and so I said, well, I want to, one day I'm going to be a professional soccer player and I'm going to play in the Olympics. Now, that was probably the first time I told anybody publicly, but I would say probably around six years old is when I really thought about it. And so you've known then for a long time that you wanted to be a professional soccer player. Um, and I guess that's what's interesting to me about you becoming a professional player is that it seems like in the United States, so many players on like the U.S. national team our first generation Americans being born in the U.S. Um, you know, do you see that trend continuing or do you think over time with the growth of the sport that there will be more players that, you know, have just their family's been here for generations? Um, and I that's do. Okay. I do. I, I think so. I think you have to you know, just look at the time period. And, and, and if you look at even the makeup of my time period and, and before me and, and for a few cycles thereafter, a lot of the players came from the East and West Coast because the ethnicities, you know, you got people coming off the boat on the East side. Yeah. And kind of the same on the West, right? And so you had these ethnicities that were really vibrant and active on the coast. And so even, even people that were coming in on the East were going to the, to the, to the West as opposed to in the middle. Yeah, and I think yeah. that's why you see so much, you know, soccer players were all coming. When you looked at the with the heat map of where the majority of players were coming from that made the team, they're East and West Coast. Yeah. Yeah, that makes but sense. I think that's going to change. And I think that's only because a lot of people came from different countries and their first sport was soccer. Yeah. Well, I mean, just thinking like, because I'm originally from the Kansas City area and, uh, you know, it seemed like with my generation, soccer was much more popular than like my father's generation or anything else. So it's, it's cool to see that growth, especially in, in the heart of the country. So I, I think one thing that you would make note though, is, is that we're on this accelerated path. And I think one of the biggest reasons is, well, you could for sure, obviously talk about major league soccer and its impact and the number of teams and all of that has obviously a large impact. But the other is, is you can't, you can't neglect technology. The fact that you have, and, and I don't mean this as a conspiracy theory. It's just, it's right. business, right? And what I'm going to say, and that is probably for the longest time, if, if, if I was a, a, 
uh, a person in you know a high management in either baseball, basketball, football, I would be doing everything I can to try to keep soccer out of the mainstream because I know that it's the world sport and I don't want it to come and take market share away from me. So I think it was much easier back when you didn't have as many media outlets to access. Whereas now the internet has changed everything. Social media has changed everything. And so yeah. access is, is not, it's hard to deny somebody access now, right? Especially if that's what they want. And I think that's why I think soccer is on such an accelerated path. And when you go to your real question, and that is, is are we talking about, you know, not first or maybe second, third, fourth generations that have been in this country? I think absolutely, because you're also seeing a much bigger pool of players also now participating in the sport that maybe never would have, probably would have went to baseball, basketball, football, but are now playing soccer. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that that makes sense because, I mean, it's a, uh... At the end of the day, all sports leagues are kind of in a competition for people and, uh, you know, that push and pull factor. But yeah, the internet has changed, you know, the access to so many things. Um, so that really is world changing for sure. Uh, what was it like playing in, in Europe and in the World Cup? And how did those experiences sort of influence your career in the MLS as a player and coach? Um, I, I'd first say playing on the national team, gave me another level of confidence just as a player. Sure, I bet. Um, but at my time, you got to remember when I was coming out, you know, nobody really, first off, soccer wasn't big in the United States and nobody regarded in Europe an American soccer player as actually being very good and never would have thought you'd be playing over there. Right. And so, you know, I was, I was the first American to play Division I soccer in Europe. Meaning, you know, that's their major league, if you will. Not playing triple-A baseball or double-A or single-A, but actually playing in the top league. But playing in major league baseball, meaning playing major league uh, over there. And it was not easy because, you know, I always had to prove myself. Always had to prove myself knowing, fact, first off, to just get on the field, but also prove myself that, hey, we Americans actually can play. And then hopefully starting that pathway for other guys to come over. That, that was a really important aspect. I, I think what was really good for me, for sure, as a player, there's a lot of experience that I grew to understand that I, I really didn't get in the United States because I was playing with a lot of guys my age and we were all trying to figure it out together. Whereas I was going over there and there were veteran players on my team and I was able to almost be mentored without really being mentored, if you know what I mean, because I actually really, really paid attention Right. Like I think a lot of players do today. I, I pay attention to all my coaches, players around me, um, but I also knew I also wanted to be a coach. So those experience had um, a profound impact on me for my later on for my coaching career as well. Um, and then, you know, the other part that you don't think about is, is the lifestyle, the, the, the having to adapt and adjust to a different culture and, understanding uh, people and environments and how do you how do you adapt and get along in that environment and how do you thrive in that environment right um, you know you try to learn the language you 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 try to eat the food you you know all of those things are so important and if you're stubborn or you're not a collaborative person I think those things can work against you and um, but I also think again they've helped me with my life um, just as a person too yeah, I think that's that's one of the things you you can't I feel like you can't really appreciate how big soccer is in Europe without being immersed in that culture. I know from living in Amsterdam where I did my masters, it it's just like different world in terms of the level of like you know that's that's their life is being around uh that game. So it's just it's amazing really. And I'm sure it must have been interesting then you know, to, to bring that experience over to the U.S. And, and, and help, I guess, in a way, kind of shape what soccer becomes over time. I, I think what you gain from it um, as a, just as a player and, and then how you use it later is, is that I, I think there's kind of levels that I didn't know existed when I was in the United States, but does did there. And that is because it was so established. And that is, you know, in the beginning, you're kind of a rookie. And what does that mean? You're, you're a young player trying to prove your stuff. And then, then you're trying to get into that, you know, lack of a better way to describe it. Maybe you're like now in the middle class and 
you're you're one of the workers. Now you're a guy that's in on a regular basis and you have to steady yourself. You have to create a foundation for yourself within the game, within your team, um, and within your position on the team. And then all of a sudden you want to then become one of the big timers in the team. You like to get to the, you know, one of the, one of the veterans. And and veterans doesn't only go with with uh, age. It also goes with experience on the field. And so now when you're playing on a regular basis, you start to be looked at in a different way. And I think all of those things were important because when I came back from Europe and I started playing MLS, I was 28 years old. I wasn't a okay. rookie anymore, but I could, but I could now help mentor some of the young players that were coming in, what it was like to be a professional. I, I wouldn't say I, I always had a really high standard of the way that I went about my craft and my, my profession but it's but it was more personality than it was having somebody to look at. Whereas when I got to Europe, it helped me to have examples and mentors, um, and then understand that when I came back to the United States and the Major League Soccer started in 1996 and I was 20 years old, it gave me the ability to now pass on some of that to some of the younger guys that were coming in. Yeah, sure, that, that makes sense. Now, what was it like to transition then from player to a coach? Um, is I'm sure that just me must almost feel weird when you're when you're a player for all these years and now you're you're the coach. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that the easiest way to probably describe it is that you know I said to you earlier I I actually knew at 13 years old I wanted to be a coach. That that's when okay, I knew yeah. I wanted to be a coach. Yeah. I knew that when I was done, like I thought hey when I'm done playing that's what I want to do I want to be a coach and. And so, you know, I told you earlier, one of the things I did was I paid attention in all my, all the meetings I had with coaches and, you know, preparation for games and all those things that always really interested me. Um, I was a real student of the game from that perspective. But what I didn't realize was that when you're a player, and, and I don't care what team sport you're playing in, you still only really have to worry about yourself, right? You, you take care of yourself, you do your job. Yeah, sure, you can help players, teammates on the field in certain situations, but at the end, you have to worry about your performance and you have to worry about, you know, making sure that you go to bed at night or you have to eat properly. That's what you have to worry about. When you're a coach, you have to worry about everybody. <laughs> and and that is so different, right? Yeah. Uh, and it's, it, it is, it's just a drastic change um, because you then think, you know, and you can you go on different sides of the spectrum of this, right? Again, I, I was a very conscientious player. I took care of myself. I was always fit, all those things. Well, my expectation was every guy was that way. Even though I played with players that weren't that way. I just expected as a coach, all players would be that way, but they weren't. So I had to figure out different things. Sometimes I had to figure out, hey, maybe I have to motivate this guy different. Or maybe I have to have a different conversation with this guy that maybe will help him start to move that way. And then I had to realize that, hey, this guy's never going to be that way. So do I want to keep working with them or do I want to move on from them? And right. so that was the things that I really had to learn. And I just think that you learn on the job in that regard. You don't, yeah. it's very hard to become prepared for that. Yeah. I mean, that takes you know, the uh, leadership role to a new level when you're in charge of an entire team as the head coach. So that's a big step. Um, yeah. Matt, yeah. And, and, and one of the, one of the examples I can give you for that is you spoke about, you know, I won an MLS cup as a player and a coach. And people ask me this question all the time. They always say, you know, which, which one was better? And I said, it's, you, you cannot even compare the two because they are so different. Sure. As a player, you, you know, you have this idea that you want to win the Super Bowl. You want to win Major League Soccer. You want to win the MLS Cup. It's all the same. You want to win that. And when you do it, there is a self-satisfaction that you accomplished one of your goals that you did with this group of guys and that was great, but no, you had your impact. When you're a coach, you have to get everybody, you have to get ownership, staff, players, fans, everybody focused and rallying behind that same goal. And so when you accomplish it, it is this incredible satisfaction of togetherness that you accomplish something as a group. When you're a player, it's more like, 
yeah, I was able, hey, I, I won an MLS Cup. I mean, right. I did. I won it with my team. Yeah. But you don't have to get everybody to think the same, to be rallied around that same idea as a coach and lead that, 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 that is incredibly satisfying when it's all done. That's why most coaches don't celebrate, I believe, because it's almost like this, oh my goodness, it's, it's, it's accomplished. It's done. You yeah. don't have any energy left. Yeah. Well, I mean, the role is just so different. Yeah. It's uh, yeah. Being a player versus being a coach where you're the mass organizer of, of all of these things. Yeah. I'm sure you're just exhausted by the, by the end and just ready to, to take a breath. So you are for sure. Now, thinking in the, in the big picture a little bit, we kind of touched upon this a bit, but how has soccer grown in the United States from your point of view over the course of your career as a player and coach? Wow, there's so many different examples I could cite to you. Um, may, maybe I'll just do one for e each of the levels. On the youth level, for example, um, Soccer's in the mainstream. You, you, you watch a sitcom and the parents are taking their kid to soccer practice, not to football practice anymore. Yeah. It's soccer. They talk about going to a soccer game. At the youth level, we have academies that are associated to all of our MLS clubs now, which means you can start out, like in our club, you can start out being 11 years old and you can play for our U12 team, our 13 or 14 or 15 or 17 or 19, our second team, and then eventually get to our first team. So you could be in our club basically your whole life and get to your get to your dream. Yeah. Whereas that never existed back when I was playing. Um, the way back in my day was you for sure go to college after high school and play college soccer. You're, you're incredibly, it was, I mean, I don't even know, maybe 0.0003%. Right, of kids yeah. could go from high school to professional back then. So you went the college route. Today, the majority of the kids go stay in the academy system, and that's how they're going to find their way into a professional team. And then on the professional level, I would say that the pool of players in our country has, is, has never been not only this big, but of such quality that we have today. Yeah, and it's due to the fact that when you look around our league, you know, next year we'll have 30 teams with St. Louis coming in. You know, I would say that other than maybe NYCFC, um, every team has their own stadium. Now, Atlanta shares it with the football team, but they have the same owner. North Carolina does the same, same owner. So, but you have soccer specific stadiums. It's just grown to a level that is just something that I never knew. And then finally, on the national team level, you know, when I would play a game in the United States and go to L.A. and we play against Mexico, it was like we were playing in Mexico because more fans would come <laughs> that were, sell, you know, yeah. supporting Mexico than they were us. Yeah. Whereas today, you go to our games for the national team and it is for sure a pro-American crowd always. And, that, yeah. and that's, that's fantastic to see. Yeah, I mean, it is amazing to see just how much growth has occurred. And I mean, I mean, the, the talent on the team today is crazy compared to, I mean, I'm sh it's shocking how much the team has improved over time. And it's not like these, I mean, all these guys on the team today are, are so young as well. I mean, that's the thing that's really interesting. Yeah, and that's, that's where the, I think the credit for the ownership groups in Major League Soccer has to come in because of the investments that they have made over the last, since 2007, in the academy structure, that pro player pathway, it has helped develop so many of these players coming through now. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty pretty impressive. Um, now, another question I have is, how has the game of soccer changed since you played? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think um, there is a much different, what I would say, uh, demand on the positional characteristics of every position on the field. So first off, everybody has to be able to play, like technically have to be very good, even the goalkeeper with their feet. Yeah. If you're not very good, you're going to struggle, number one, trying to make it to the next level as a player. Like you may not make it to Major League Soccer um, or you may have a short-lived career 
in the game if you don't progress quickly um, in that aspect. I also think the physical aspect is much more demanding. Um, it, it's more demanding in the actual 90 minutes maybe today because the game is very fast. But back then when I played, we were able to play more games in a shorter window with a much more congested schedule. And we played with less injury. Interesting. It, 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 it's for sure. Yeah. Um, but I also think today there's a, there's a much bigger demand on so much more. Like I said, the, the physicality of the league is, is very demanding. The amount of travel, the number of games you play, um, but then just on the field, there is um, a lot of demand on the tactical sense of the game by individual teams. Um, style of play or model of play is very important to, I would say, 75% of the teams that are playing. There's still 25% of the teams that play that they're a little more, hey, I, I get good players, I put them together, I put them in formation, you guys go let your let your qualities, you know, shine. Um, but most teams are very pragmatic about what they do. Um, and that takes a lot more coaching uh, and, and it takes a lot more consistency in the way that teams are built and how long a coach is with that team. Um, because if you constantly are changing your coach, you're constantly changing that model of play. And those yeah. players that you have from the last coach may not fit the new style of play of the next coach. And so then there's a lot of turnover of roster. And there's, there's a lot of things that, that, that uh, affect the either consistency or lack thereof um, based on that consistency, I think, within staff. I think that's, that's one of the things that's always been really fascinating also is just how a player for one coach can be a totally different player on a team than with a different coach. Um, it, I guess it just shows how complex the game is and all the different factors at play. Um, but yeah, you can have complete changes in a player and, and how successful they are uh, due to things like that. Yeah, and, and we've all had them. We, all, we have all had them. Um, I had a player here when I first took over, um, Hercules Gomez. He was a good yeah. player, right? He was a good player. But the way we were moving on and playing, it just, it just didn't fit. And, you know, he goes on to this great career in Mexico and does really, really well. He left here on a free at the time, which was great for him, which I think helped with this thing. And I, whenever I talk to him here and they're always telling him that he, he owes me a, a, a bottle of wine or a big thank you for helping propel his career because he had a great career after yeah. he left us. But I just don't think that at the time where we were, he fit us or vice versa and where we were trying to go. And that happens. Um, but that doesn't mean that, a player is a bad player or, you know, the club's a bad club. It just sometimes things don't fit properly and you have to find the um, what does fit. And I always say that coaches, staffs and players are always searching for a home where they feel most comfortable. Yeah, no, definitely. That's definitely true. Um, now, you mentioned about when you were playing, there was more games going on. Um, I, what I, uh, more, it was more so that you would play more games in a mm -hmm. very congested period of time. Okay. Yeah. That's really what, it, and so like, sometimes we know, I remember playing um, when I was in at that time it was called the a league, which was, would have been second division. We used to play a game on a Friday and a Sunday and wow. you'd play like Friday in New Jersey and Sunday in Miami. Jeez. Okay. And, and you had to play 90 minutes and nobody ever thought differently. And you yeah. played like I, I would play 90 minutes in both games and that's what I had to do. And then yeah. we then we come back to training and start training the next week, and that would be it. And we wasn't like this ton of regen and all these different things that went on. So it was much different back then in that regard. And what what was the balance like between playing on the national team as well as your club team? Because I guess one of the things I hear people talking about today is how many national team players are getting hurt, um, and and people are talking about you know, are there too many games between club teams and national teams with all the different things going on? Yeah, there are. I, I think I think the schedule is incredibly congested for players. Uh, and I do think that there's, there's more, um, there's just more games for them to play with their national teams. You know, FIFA has come up with all these different 
tournaments now to, yeah. to make it so they don't have to say that they're friendlies. So now they say they're these competitions that they play in. Yeah. But they're kind of the same thing, right? Um, right. And, and I, it, it just winds up being more games for the players. And I also think that you have to take consideration that, again, you know, there, there's, there's a soccer league everywhere, right? Every country has their own professional league. Yep. So players have all these different places and they're playing all over the world. And so the travel is pretty extensive. Sometimes you're going into different climates. You're going into altitude. There's just a lot of different variations that a player has to adapt and adjust to, let alone the travel. Um, and so I, I believe the demand is high on the player from a physical perspective. I also think that the other thing is because these things don't always work hand in hand. As much as I would say, like, look, we have an incredible facility. Or we have unbelievable stadium. We have all these great things. We have great staff and have all these great things. Um, and we have, you know, like I said, our, our, our first uh, team in our, in our pro player pathway is U12. But a lot of kids don't also, in their, just in their culture, they don't do what maybe I did when I was a kid. I mean, I grew up playing every single sport that you can think within my neighborhood all the time. Um, we learned how to pick teams. We learned how to argue whether it was a goal or it wasn't a goal. Like, we learned how to figure those things out ourselves because we had no structure. Yeah. We had to make our own structure. And so today, the kids, you create all the structure for them, but they don't know how to do that. They also don't get a chance to have crossover in other sports, right? So maybe one day I'm playing football. The next day I'm playing basketball. The next day I'm playing soccer. I'm playing baseball. I'm, I'm climbing trees. Like all of that helps with the sport that you wind up playing and sure. makes you a well-rounded athlete. And I think that the foundation of the kids today is more specialized to their sport, but it doesn't mean that they're well-rounded in their physical foundation that they have because of just being able to do so many things. And I think that has an effect on players as well with injury. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense because I know that when I was in high school, not too long ago now, uh, you know, they were coaches were actively discouraging people from playing on multiple sports teams. And it was like, no, you got to pick one sport uh, type of deal. So it's interesting to see how that's changed over time. Um, another factor when it comes to all these games and the schedule are, I wonder how that impacts fans. Um, because I, I know that there are probably some fans that may just like to casually watch soccer. And if there's a game on all the time, then they can watch it. But if there's fans trying to, you know, follow everything that's going on, I feel like it can almost be confusing because there's so many games that you're like, okay, what is this league again? Or what, you know, what's this tournament for? And how does that connect to everything? Um, I, I mean, I concur with you, uh, you know, a hundred percent. I really do. And that is, there's a couple of different scenarios there for me. Um, one is obviously I would say most of the world, their league starts usually sometime in August and goes all the way to about May. And then they have that break in the summertime and then they start up again. Our league starts in January and goes all the way basically through to November, or December. So we're on a, a different time period. Well, FIFA has lined up all of their international windows based on the rest of the world and the way that they have their schedule, right? So August to May. And so those windows that it's an international window, the league stops in that country. So what happens is those players that have to leave their teams aren't now available if they were to continue to play through those windows, which we do in a lot of respects. Yeah, yeah. Our league doesn't stop. And so I think that in itself becomes confusing, first of all, just what's going on. I think the other part of it is, is that our fans wonder like, well, why, why how are you letting your best players leave when you have to play games? That's crazy. Because yes, they can't yeah. understand that. Yeah. And, and then and then the other is, is that we have these competitions that go on. So you have, you know, MLS has league play, which is normal league play. I tell you qualify for the playoffs and so on. And then you have US Open Cup, which is which is a great competition. But most, there's a lot of fans that don't understand it. So basically, it would be like saying like this. If you were using the analogy of baseball, you have Major League Baseball, AAA, AA, single A. Well, if you allowed all the single A teams kind of to play against each other early on in this tournament, then whoever was surviving, then they played, yeah. you know, sec, you know, double A. 
and then maybe they played some triple A and you can have a single A team playing against a major league baseball team in a game. And if yeah. they knock them out, they move on to the next round. Right. It's, it's, it's really, it's actually a really neat tournament. Right. Because it's open. That's the whole U S open cup. It's open. Yeah. But when you, if you don't understand that you don't have a set schedule of how that works, it can become extremely confusing. And then you throw what we have here and they have over in Europe is champions league. Yep. Oh, if you won the MLS cup last year, you qualify for next year. So, <laughs> So my thing about it is, is, is it's not that you have them. I just think that what we have not done a very good job of yet, some of that is based on the evolution of our league, is that when you know the number of teams you have, when you now you can then build your schedule in and you don't have a World Cup now jumping in the middle of the winter as opposed to the summer when it usually is. And all these things are changing. I think it's hard for the average fan to follow and Shoot, I'm a coach, and sometimes I'm confused. I'm like, all right, wait, when's that competition coming up? So I think we need some more consistency, and then we also need some more communication about how this fits into the overall picture of the game and the world of soccer. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, come on the podcast and, and share all your insights um, I look forward to seeing what you continue to do with your career and all the accomplishments you've been piling up. Um, and thanks for all the stuff you've done for soccer in the country and in, in Kansas City. So, I appreciate it, Ben. Uh, pleasure to join your show and uh, all the best with uh, as you move forward.